Well, thank you, Erica and Gracie. That was, uh, that was very nice, wasn't it? <laughs> Managed to survive a few technical hitches there. <laughs> Well, it's just a real blessing to, to be here this morning on this Sabbath. I, I feel a, a tremendous sense of blessing so that I can say grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that as we enter into this, this time together that we will enter truly enter into the presence of our Heavenly Father through the, the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want to uh, just say... Thank you, Carol, for mentioning your prayer request for Igor and Bill and myself as we go to Europe. Uh, I've never been to Europe before, but I'm going to the homeland of my father, who dwell, who was born in the Netherlands, so that will be one of the things that I'm really looking forward to. But more than that, I'm looking forward to meeting all of the believers that are growing in uh, Romania and Serbia and Austria and Germany and Netherlands and France. These are all the countries we, we plan to visit. And so we continue to solicit your prayers. And the other thing that was in my mind is that uh, I've mentioned this to a number of people now. You know, people talk about AD and BC. Well, I have BT and AT, now, before tabernacles and after tabernacles. Uh, when I came up to Tabernacles, my, my ability to, uh, to preach and to uh, be active was very restricted. But uh, at my time at Tabernacles, I not only managed to get here uh, and to survive the experience and being engaged often at night in dialogue until midnight, many nights, I was able to do several presentations and I went home stronger than when I came, and that strength has continued to grow so much so that it was upon that experience that when the Lord impressed me to take a trip to, to do a tour, a missionary tour, that I would do this in the strength of tabernacles and, uh, and in the prayers of the saints because um, each day for me is a tremendous miracle. Just to be able to stand here today is a tremendous miracle for me, knowing what I was like 12 months ago and what I am experiencing now. So I believe the Lord has allowed these things to happen so that I know whatever would happen in my ministry, it is not I but Christ who dwelleth in me. Because I can't do, I, there is no logical reason why I should be doing what I'm doing uh, and yet he gives me the strength to do it each day, each moment, and so I'm immensely grateful uh, to him. Uh, I also am grateful for the continued uh, prayers and support uh, that come through in the email and the, the encouragement, and uh, I received uh, a, a, a wonderful letter from my mother. I don't know if she's watching, or maybe she'll watch it a bit later. It's... Uh, it's 2.30 in the morning there, so I don't think she'll be up now. Uh, <laughs> but she wrote me a letter of encouragement to encourage me uh, that uh, her and Dad are, are thinking of me every day and they're praying for me every day. They're very pleased with the work that I'm doing for the Lord. And as a son, that is something that I treasure very deeply, uh, that my parents are well pleased with me. Uh, in, in the work that I'm doing and uh, I took that as my father speaking to me through my parents and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very, very thankful to them and of course to my wife uh, and my children. I spoke to my oldest son uh, just the other night. He had returned from a 10-day mission trip in Fiji and uh, I was very pleased with the report that he gave me so that uh, I can say, uh, as my parents were pleased with me, so the blessing, I was pleased with my son and uh, how he was helpful. I was also very grateful that uh, of all the students that went, it was a school mission trip, of all the students were, that went, uh, as, I was, as it was reported to me, he was one of two students who didn't have to come to the point of running to the toilet every and vomiting and all of those kinds of things. Um, 
Uh, I know it was the Lord that protected him, but I'm sure that the, uh, uh, the olive leaf extract and the wild oregano oil and the colloidal silver didn't hurt either. So we were very, very grateful that he came home without uh, succumbing to, to those things. And of course, uh, for me, uh, in regards to this trip, uh, I am in two modes. Uh, this is, trip is going very fast and very slow at the same time. Uh, it's, it's wonderful as I'm meeting all the brethren and uh, the, the ministry. It's going very, very quick. But in regards to uh, being with my wife and my children, this is day 87 of 203. So, uh, and uh, we're nearly halfway. So, <laughs> so uh, pray for me on that one that uh, we can continue this, this journey. So at this point, I would, uh, I would just like if we can once again kneel and uh, we will pray. Our Father in heaven, it's such a joy to be able to call you Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, to know that you delight in us through Christ Jesus, that your heart is for us and that you have done everything. Everything that we have, every breath that we take is a, is a gift from heaven. Every beat of our heart is an assurance of your love for us. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you that I can be here. I want to thank you for each of my brothers and sisters here and all those that are listening through the broadcast. I want to thank you for their fellowship and friendship and that they have chosen to walk this narrow path with us in these last days. We know, Father, that you are preparing a people ready to meet the Lord, that you are calling us to the worship of the one true God and his only begotten Son in the Spirit. And we know that you are calling us to your statutes and your judgments that were recorded for the benefit and the blessing of God's people. We pray that we would come into all the fullness that you have promised us in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings of the Lord, that they may be ours by faith as we come up to the Jordan and we are asked to step into that mighty swift torrent that we will walk without flinching, knowing that you are our God and you are with us and we are well able to go up into the promised land and to take it. For in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And we pray these things in his mighty name. Amen. As I was sitting there and looking at the title of our study from... Uh, Sabbath school. I looked down at the title and I smiled because as I looked at the title of the lesson which I had omitted to look at carefully uh, beforehand and then I looked at the title, uh, the first part of my presentation, my presentation that the title is Our Loving Father. And that was without me knowing what the title of the lesson was, was Our Loving Heavenly Father, which is what I meant in my title. And so I thought, isn't this uh, wonderful, the connection that we see? And I, I just want to spend, uh, meditate on a few passages as we think about our Heavenly Father. And I love to, to dwell upon Exodus 34 and verse 6. This, this text means much to me. It means much to me often when I have felt the rebuke of my father as he is chastening me and he is uh, bringing me to the fullness of sonship in Christ Jesus, I remember the first word that he speaks, that our father speaks of himself, uh, Exodus 34 and verse 6, and the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, what does it say? Merciful. Our Father is merciful. I have experienced that mercy. I am experiencing that mercy. I know you are experiencing that mercy. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty as it goes on. 
What a beautiful picture of our Father. It's good to dwell upon these things. Our Father is merciful. He is long-suffering. He is abundant in goodness and in truth. It's just good to dwell upon these realities. If we would dwell more and more upon these things, how much less we would murmur and complain for the trials that we face in this life. David in Psalms 36 and verse 7 Turn to the book of Psalms. David loved to praise our God. Psalms 36. Verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. We put our trust under the shadow of the wings of our God because we know that he is excellent in loving kindness. His loving kindness is excellent. We do not feel afraid to come into the shadow of the Almighty because we know that he is excellent in his loving kindness. Turn quickly over to 63 and verse 3, another passage, as we remind ourselves. 63, verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Is that true? Is his loving kindness better than life? If this were true, then would we fear death? Would we fear death? If truly we believe that the loving kindness of God is better than life. I I am personally challenged by just the thought of that passage. The thought of, going to a foreign country, the thought of flying thousands of miles. Who knows what we will anticipate? And there is Satan ready to say to me, you could die. And so I remember, his loving kindness is better than life. That's a challenging statement. My lips shall praise thee. Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Is it not a good thing to have these times where we can come to ne- together and just say to one, one another, I'm just, I'm just feeling a sense of joy about my Father in heaven. I'm just, I, feel, I just have to tell you that I love him and that he means so much to me and isn't he so wonderful? Some people say, well, that's a, that's a little bit gushy, isn't it? Well, the book, this book is full of it. It's good for us to testify to the goodness of our Father because Satan is ever suggesting to us all the reasons why we should be frustrated and why we should be downhearted because of what other people are saying about us or what they are doing to us. But it says here that his loving kindness is better than life. Therefore, my lips shall praise thee. And of course, we know Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness. There's that word again, have I drawn thee. How many times does our Father speak to us? I love you. You are precious to me. You are my child. Do we believe it? And because he loves us, because our our Heavenly Father loves us, he wants to us to sit with him and he wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to us things of goodness and peace. He wants us to listen. Listen. The Shema. Listen. Hear, O Israel. He wants us to listen. And in the book of Proverbs, listen to our Father as he speaks to us. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear 
unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the ways of his saints. Can you hear the Father's heart? My son, my daughter, if you will listen to my words, listen to what I'm telling you. If you would but listen, I can bless you. I can show you marvelous and excellent things. I can preserve your pathway so that you will not be hurt. This is what our Father says. Again, chapter 3, he speaks to us. And I was um, thinking of the song in Be Thou My Vision. I thy true son. A true son listens to his father, doesn't he? A true daughter listens to her father. Verse uh, Chapter 3. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart ke uh, keep my commandments. Notice how it says, let your heart keep my commandments. It doesn't say, make your heart keep the commandments. Let it. Allow me to live my laws and my commandments and my statutes and my judgments within you. I can do it. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is what he's telling us. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Where is the commandment with promise? Length of days. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Why does we get length of days? By listening to our parents, because they are the appointed agencies to speak to us the words of God. That we listen, listen. This is what he's saying to us. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tables of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. I have no uh, reservations in saying to you that much of my sickness in my life has been because I have leaned to my own understanding. I have trusted in myself. I have thought myself wiser and smarter than other men. And that is part of the reason why I have had the affliction that I have had. But all things work together for good, that I can move out of this experience and out of this understanding to trust my Father completely in these things. So our Father wants to teach us. Jeremiah 29, I like uh, verse 11. I like uh, the New International Version in this particular reading for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's our Father. This is what He wants for us. This is what He desires for us. But of course, the, the difficulty for each of us is that there is one who has told lies about our Father. John 8, 44 talks about the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. And he has told lies. The lies were in the Garden of Eden in the beginning. Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Ye shall not surely die. God is hiding something from you. And when Eve ate the fruit and Adam ate the fruit, they not only believed themselves to be entering into a new existence, they also believed that God was harsh and that God was hiding something from them and that he did not actually have their best good in mind in dealing with them. 
And this is the inheritance that we receive from the first Adam, a natural bent, a natural inclination to believe that God would do us harm rather than do us good. And that either we must distance ourselves from him or we must placate him with ceremonies and rituals and works in order to please him, to keep him appeased so that we would not get in his way and cause him any difficulties. We just need to keep him under control. This is the natural human experience. And so this lie... This lie, of course, uh, you shall not surely die, uh, has led all men by nature to the position of my will, not thy will, to lean to my own understanding and in all my ways to acknowledge me rather than he who has given me life, because if we have life in ourselves, we don't need to acknowledge someone outside of ourselves. And so, in believing this lie, man does not look to God naturally, he looks to himself. And in looking to himself, he has erected mountains of philosophy and deep valleys of depression and worthlessness in order to prevent the plain path of the glory of our God to come to us and his great love for us. And so within each human heart there is this desolation, the mountains of man's devising, the mountain that, oh, what does it say in uh, Jeremiah, I'm against the O oh, destroying mountain and he throws this mountain into the sea as Elijah comes to his people. But we have these mountains and we have these valleys that have been erected in the human heart that when God would come to us and say, my son, my daughter, come to me, the mountains are in the way and the valleys are in the way and the straight path is not there in order for God to reach us. And we find ways to uh, manipulate and to undermine our Father in heaven as we are told in uh, um, the parable of the talents, the man with the one talent. There was one thing that he knew. I knew thee, that you are a hard man and that you reap where you do not sow. This is an echo back to the garden. God is trying to hide something from you. I knew you, that you were a hard man. And so by nature, man is resistant to being instructed, resistant. He says, why do you be like the mule that needs the bit in its mouth of the horse that I need to bridle you and hold on to you because you keep trying to break free. You won't listen to what I'm saying. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us the extent of this problem in the human experience. That all of us, as it says in the book of Psalms, man goes astray from the womb. He walks away. My father, uh, uh, my earthly father spoke to me when I was a very small child and he would take me, we would go to the park and he would call out to me and I would run in the other direction because I was enjoying my freedom running away from my father. We go astray from the womb. I was only two or three years old and I'm running away from my father, laughing as I'm running away, not knowing of the dangers that could have been there for me if he didn't catch up with me and pick me up and promptly bring me back. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is what the Bible says to us. Deceitfully wicked, because of the lie, you shall not surely die. God hath said, but I have willed, and I will do mine own pleasure. I sit a queen, I shall not sorrow, I shall do what I desire. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built for the glory of my majesty? This is the spirit of man by nature. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. 
Isaiah chapter 1 tells us the difficulty. Uh, verse 4, our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They are, have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Oh, why dwell upon such dreary subjects as this? Because correct healing comes from correct diagnosis. And this is the human experience, that if we would be healed, then we would understand the nature that comes to us. Romans 3.10, as I said, I've said before, this is uh, one of the most freeing passages of Scripture for me because it gives me a diagnosis. It causes me to run to Christ uh, in realization of how difficult the circumstances are. Uh, Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. If anyone thinks they are seeking after God, they are wrong. The only reason we are seeking after God is because we are being sought by God. He is sending out his shepherd to the lost sheep to draw us to himself. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, speaking out our murmuring and complaining for the things that other people do to us and speak to us and don't speak to us and all of these things. And such is the experience. And we uh, each... I can relate to this in the story of the prodigal sons, plural. The son that stayed at home, who outwardly did his father's will but despised his father. He was engaging in the arts of manipulation and control uh, to try and win for his father. But in his heart he despised his father. Uh, and the younger son who manifested an open resistance of his father and says, give me my inheritance, you may as well be as good as dead to me. I'm going and I'm taking your living and I'm going to live off your living with riotous uh, living. And we see in that story, once again, in the story of the, the younger prodigal, we see the human heart going astray from the father. The older son was more difficult to detect because he stayed at home as many who attend church from week to week performing the rituals of the Christian life without joy. And so we see that this spirit of resistance to the Father's authority, the natural uh, resistance that is manifested is also manifested in the natural heart's resistance to any authority that God would grant. We see this in the fifth commandment, honour your father and your mother. Uh, at two years of age, I think of, well, I can't think of my own experience. I can speak of my children's experience and those that, I don't remember what I was doing at two years of age, but my parents did tell me some stories. But having witnessed this in my children at that particular age, where as a parent you speak to your child and the child says, no. Or they don't say necessarily no, they simply keep doing what they're doing. Don't play in that cupboard, please. Keep pulling things out of the cupboard. Keep going. Don't touch this. Go and grab it. 
we can relate to this. When we act like this as children towards our parents, we are developing, and I'll use that word again, a pattern of how to relate to authority. Our parents are ordained of God to be a channel to give us life and therefore they are a channel by which his authority is manifested. And this is where we read in Romans chapter 13 the beginnings of this. Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The first higher power in our life is our parents. They are the higher powers that God has placed in our lives foremost in teaching us the ways of the Lord or as they are designed, uh, they were designed to teach us that, that way. For there is no power but of God. Is that true? Is this verse true? Is there no power but of God? The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that, res that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. If as a child you engage in the process of resistance towards the authority that has been placed in your life, in those things which the Bible uh, is not against what the Scripture teaches, if you develop a spirit of resistance, you will develop in your mind a pattern of thinking towards authority, which if not re repented of and turned away from, shall lead to damnation. This is what the Scripture says to us. And there are particularly two times I have observed in the experience of most people in life in between 2 and 3 and 4, and then it comes again at 13, 14 and 15. The spirit of rebellion and resistance that manifests in the human heart. And it is in these two time periods in particular where we see the pattern of thinking that is developed within the human heart. And I would suggest to each of us here that the cornerstone of our relationship to authority in our lives is based on our relationship to our primary caregivers, namely our parents. And the relationship that we sustain to our parents, the pattern of thinking that we have in relationship to them, is the pattern for which we will relate to all authority in our lives. That's a challenging statement, isn't it? This is what I have found in, in my experience. And this is why it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that if a man know not how to take care of his family, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now I have spoken with regard to us being in the position of uh, the under authority, of the one who is under authority. We want to speak a little bit about uh, the person who is in the position of authority and how we deal with those things, but I want to extend this principle of there is no power but of God. Other positions of government in this country, are they a power which God has granted to them? Is that power given of God? Is, does he allow this to take place? No one can hold a position of power without God allowing it to take place and therefore we need to be very careful of how we relate and this is, this is something that I am continually reminded of. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. We want to, uh, 1 Timothy, just get over there, chapter 2. Verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplication and prayers, intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. So that we might say that what Paul is saying to us here is to pray, not to spray leaders 
with our expressions of frustration and murmuring and complaining, but to pray for those who are in authority, for the kings, for kings and for all that are in authority. And I want to relate to you a passage that I find particularly challenging, and that is in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice what it says in verse... Um, let's, uh, let's read from verse 16 because this gives us some context. 1 Peter 2.16 uh, As free and not using liberty for a cloak of maliciousness but as the servants of God. Note those words well. As free, free sons and daughters, children of the firstborn free sons and daughters, yet not using our freedom as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honour all, it says men, it says honour all, men is the supplied word, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the king. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the, what's that word? You know what that word means? Perverse. Is that really what we should do? Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the perverse. What does it mean to be subject? The, the natural human reaction, the human response is, oh, so you're saying we should do whatever they tell us. No. I'm talking about attitude. I'm talking about how we relate. We need to be careful to those who've been given authority and whatever authority. Jude chapter 1 and verse 8 says, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. Much of this speech is being generated from the cornerstone pattern of how we have related to the primary authority caregivers in our lives, and that is to resist. I will not have this over me, and I know thee that thou art a hard man, and I can prove that you are a hard man, because I have all of this evidence. I've seen all the YouTube videos, I've watched it all, and I know that you are a hard man. And so now I need to spread the gospel of venom against people in authority. This is the gospel for many, many. It's a gospel that I have been caught up in. To speak words of venom towards those who occupy positions of authority. And this news is going out around the globe against those in authority. The Bible commands us to pray for those in authority, not to spray those who are in authority. And I find that uh, challenging, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the perverse. And that is a tremendous challenge. How shall we rise up to this challenge? This is where we come back to Proverbs chapter 3. Let thine heart keep my commandments. This is not something that we can do by nature, this is not something that we can respond to, but this is where we come to the seed or the, the, the Abraham, the father, and to the seed. We see in the life of Abraham, and this is where we read our scripture reading again. We come back to the scripture reading. We see in the life of Abraham... In Genesis chapter 18, we see something that would have brought joy to the heart of God. God placed this in him, of course. He says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Genesis 18, it says, and verse uh, 16, and the men rose up 
from thence and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them and to bring them on their way and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that which I do seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him the Lord was able to bring upon Abraham the things that he had spoken of him because Abraham listened to authority the authority of his father he listened he allowed the spirit of Christ to enter his heart that seed of promise and we see here in Matthew 3:17 we see the culmination of humanity receiving the benediction of our Heavenly Father Christ as the embodiment or the fulfillment of what Isaac did when Isaac laid himself upon the altar of sacrifice he fully submitted himself to the authority of his father even when it seemed perverse to do so in this particular case he submitted himself and Isaac being the seed carries through to the person of Christ and Christ of course he submits himself to the authority of the day in John the Baptist who was called and he receives baptism at his hand and he comes out of the water and then Jesus receives for us the benediction the blessing that all of us can receive and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased this transaction is pivotal it is incredibly important that we understand here we have the second Adam receiving the blessing of the father and it is in reading these passages that we all can become sons and daughters of Abraham in order that we may be blessed that we may give a blessing that those when we give a blessing that those our children and those under our care can receive a blessing in order that they can give a blessing and this is why the voice of one crying in the wilderness is a voice that turns the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers to restore the blessing principle because at the heart of the gospel is the good news that our Father in Heaven loves us that he's well pleased with us that he doesn't hold our transgressions against us he's not asking us to manufacture some system of works in order to please him Christ has received as the second Adam as as the son of David as the seed of Abraham he has received the benediction of his father and he then is able to share it with us so that we can be reconnected to that blessing because um, and I need to just read a, a few more passages on this let's read Luke chapter 1 and verse 17 and we'll tie some things together here Luke 1 and verse 17 John the Baptist coming in the power and the spirit of Elijah it says and he shall go before him Christ in this he will go before Christ as John the Baptist in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children in order that they may speak benediction of blessing upon their children and in pouring a blessing upon them this will turn it says here to the ch uh, children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just because we all by nature are disobedient that child that doesn't listen to the parent but in receiving the blessing we can be turned to from disobedience to obedience and this is this is why this principle of learning to place ourselves in a submissive spirit this is why the principles of David in dealing with Saul in Hannah in dealing with her situation with her husband in Abigail in dealing with her perverse 
and useless husband. These lessons cry out to us as to how we should relate to our situation and the difficulties that we are facing. Because this is the Elijah message. The reconnection of family values. Because as I stated before, the primary relationship you have with, the, with your father or your primary caregiver, your father and mother, if there is animosity, if there is suppressed anger in your spirit towards that person, you will have suppressed anger and aggression and manipulation towards all authority, including God himself. It's a big statement. And this is why it says, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 308, the fifth commandment requires children not only to yield respect, submission and obedience to their parents, and as the Bible says, in the Lord, when our parents command us to do things that are against the scriptures, we must say to them, we cannot. But we don't say to them, I will not. We say, I'm sorry, I cannot, because the scripture commands me otherwise. And we do so in a spirit of love, not in a spirit of defiance. Submission and obedience to their parents, but also to give them love and tenderness, to lighten their cares, to guard their reputation, to guard the reputation of our parents, and to succor and comfort them in old age. It also enjoins respect for ministers and rulers and for all others to whom God has delegated authority. I remember the first time I read that, I'm like, whoa. The fifth commandment enjoins respect for ministers, rulers, and for all others whom God has delegated authority. Therefore, as it is, this is the first commandment with promise, that our days may be long upon the land which the Lord our God gives us, that we maintain a gentle and meek spirit towards those who have been granted authority, not only to the good, but also to the perverse, which is a challenge to us. So what do we have happen where we're in a family situation and there is a man or a husband who is the leader of his home who has not been blessed, who has not received the blessing of Abraham, who has not come to the scriptures and read, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and believe that he is accepted in the beloved. For all leaders in their households can receive this blessing through Christ Jesus if they desire it, if they wish for it, they can receive this blessing. For only a blessed man can bless his wife and children and all those under his care and under his authority. If you are not a blessed man, if you are cursed, you will curse. And the only way to break the curse is to come to him that was hung upon a tree. Cursed is he that is hung upon a tree. He exhausted the curse. He exhausted that negativity. He took it with him to the grave so that we can be released from that cycle of negativity and the need to continue to curse those that have been placed under our care. And so what happens when a man who is the leader of his, should be the leader of his family, when his two-year-old child challenges his authority? What does a cursed man do when his authority is challenged? He becomes controlling. He becomes tyrannical. How dare you oppose my authority? How dare you question me? How dare you? I will show you what's going to happen now. And we see this happen over and over. When a cursed man is challenged by his children, and mind you, when his children challenge him, they are simply feeding back to him his own character. His own spirit is coming back to him. His sense of rebellion, his sense of revolt against his parents and against the God of heaven manifests in his children. And when they manifest the very behaviors which he himself has 
uh, conducted in his own life, he is offended. He is upset about this. I can certainly say in my own life, I, I remember uh, a number of times when uh, my children in very direct words said to me, well, that's just your opinion. My first instinct was not a good one. My first instinct rose from the first Adam. It was not a good feeling, but then a voice cried out to me, Adrian, Adrian, listen to me, listen to me. I'd show you a better way. I'd show you a better way in dealing with your children. Your children are stamped with your worthlessness. They're only manifesting what you have inherited and you are simply passing it on. I'll show you a better way in dealing with this situation if you let me. Let me bless you so that when you are blessed, when your son inadvertently curses you, you can absorb the curse and continue to love and embrace and gently guide him or her to, be, to stay on course, to not be thrown off by the words of those who have been placed under your care, to not be pushed by their words, to not be triggered by the things that they would say so that your wrath is aroused. But as happens in uh, so many homes, when a, when a father or mother who is cursed is provoked by their children, they begin to speak words of frustration over their children, not realising that all the words they speak have power to form character. All the words that they speak are prophetic. And a child, when they hear their parents say to them, you always do this. Why do you keep doing this? You good for nothing. Prophetic words, good for nothing. How many people here and listening to this presentation have heard those words, you are good for nothing? And Satan laughs, saying, I can bind you, I can hold you, because when, when a caregiver utters those words, Satan rejoices. He rejoices. When a father or mother raise their voice in anger, he rejoices. The spirit of prophecy tells us, and I have been personally rebuked by this, that a, the husband and preacher of his home should not raise his voice to his wife and children. It's a challenging statement, isn't it? A mother should not raise her voice or scream at her children. This is what inspiration tells us. But so when we do these things, when we engage in this behaviour, when we are provoked for whatever reason, we didn't have enough sleep. It's hard sometimes. Children don't seem to understand that sometimes we only get two hours sleep because we had to do this and we had to do that and we, we ourselves are suffering from a virus or something and we're not feeling very well and we have to get our taxes done and we have to please this person and we have to do this and then the child comes in and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And we go, kaboom! Why does God allow these things to happen to us? So we can see what's in our hearts. We don't want to be placed in a position where we say, well, if it wasn't for this and this and this and this and this, then I wouldn't be doing this. Well, God allows this and this and this and this to happen so we can see what is in our hearts. Because what is manifested is only an expression of what is deep within our hearts. And if anger and aggression and irritation is coming out, it is because it is within. And God is allowing circumstances to come into our lives so that when it comes out, we have the opportunity either to confess that sin and repent or to blame other people for putting us in this circumstance, thus continuing the perpetual slavery that we are in by blaming other people 
The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me of the fruit and I did eat. I just threw these things in the fire and this thing came out. Well, Samuel, you should have turned up yesterday because I had to force myself to do this sacrifice because you wouldn't show up at the right time. It's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else's fault. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And so we see in the, the lives of, of people where this begins to happen, where someone who is worthless, someone who has experienced the curse, someone who has been told, you are good for nothing, living out that good for nothing experience and pouring it upon their wife and their children. So when a wife... And when children are in the situation where the husband is doing these things, and, and this is a clear indication that he's in a state of worthlessness, if a wife then comes to her husband and, and saying, you're doing it wrong, you're wrong, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, well, what is a worthless man going to do with that information? He's going to become more tyrannical. He's going to become more aggressive. He's going to become more violent because he's worthless. And that's how worthless children are developed because worthless children come from worthless men and worthless women. But all the time the Bible is crying out to us, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased with you in Christ Jesus. You can obtain that sense of blessing, that sense of I am loved of the Father so I can break the cycle. I will bring down the mountains. I will lift up the valleys. I will make straight in the desert a highway because most of us in our family experiences have lived in the desert, haven't we? Dysfunction, desert experience where there is no living water being poured upon your soul. The abomination that makes desolate in the human heart. Most of us have experienced this in our lives. And so... I don't care how eloquently a man preaches the gospel. If in his attitude and in his mindset he is not responding to the turning of the heart to the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, he has nothing to say. Because I have witnessed many an evangelist speak with eloquent words and power and then go home and abuse the daylights out of his family. What kind of a gospel is that? Does pure and foul waters come out of the same stream? No, it does not. So this, these are the questions that made me wonder. If this man speaks such beautiful words and yet he abuses his family in this manner, what message is he really bringing? Mind you, in that state of mind, of course, my perverse nature was going, well, I thank you, God, I'm not like him. We are all tarred with one brush. Some express it more than others, and this is the other thing about the human experience. Some of us have been placed in a situation where we manifest more of this worthless behavior than others, but it is just as much present in the next person as it is in the first person. The seeds of that rebellion, the seeds of that worthlessness are present in everybody. They only need to be brought out by a series of natural circumstances for this to take place. Does this make sense? No one, there is none that seeketh after God. None. Just some manifest the worthlessness more than others. Also, shall we look upon those who manifest such worthlessness and say, I oh, thank you, God, I'm not like them. Brothers and sisters, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. But in seeing the difficulty and the dysfunction of those around me, God is speaking to me and he is warning me, Adrian, this is you. This is you. But by my grace or whatever I have been able to do for you, you're not manifesting that in the same way that they are, but you are no different to them. He is you and you is he. For we are all of one. And so... This is why Elijah must come. The beauty we, we find is that when Christ came, 
he absorbed all of the perverseness of authority that has gone off track. The perverseness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that moved to murder him. The perverseness of the Romans who only wanted to deal with their, just get this out of, just deal with it, kill him, just get rid of him. We don't need this. It was perverse. It was corrupt. Christ submitted himself to this process. He allowed the full venom of the curse of man to be wreaked upon himself in order that we may receive the full blessing that the Father has given to him. And this is where we read in 1 Peter 2.23. Here is words of hope for all of us. 1 Peter 2.23. Let's have a look at this. 1 Peter 2, 23. 22, who did no sin, that covers everything, doesn't it? But notice, it, it brings out something. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. No deceit, no jesting, no joking, no saying, I didn't mean what I said. None of that was in his mouth. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Hallelujah. There we have someone who has fully observed all that man could wreak upon someone under authority. And he did not fight back. He absorbed all of it. The spirit of this man is available to you and to me today. The spirit of this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is here for us today. If we want it, if we want his spirit, if we want to break free of murmuring and complaining and cursing those who curse us, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is here today. If we want to accept the meek and the lowly Jesus into our hearts, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because I have absorbed the curse of worthlessness. I was hung upon the tree in order that you can break free of these things. All these things I have done for you. This is why in beginning to understand these things, I had to think very carefully about my relationship to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because I was raised in this communion. I was raised and taught the truths of the Sabbath and the Second Coming, the Sanctuary, the Spirit of Prophecy, the Health Reform, the Three Angels' Messages. All these things I was taught within this communion that I was raised in. Now we notice in Peter that it says that we should be uh, submit ourselves not only to the good but also to the perverse. That means we should be discerning in our mind who is good and who is perverse because there is a perverseness that has come into this communion of faith in the idolatry that has been manifested in the worship of the three-in-one God, the Trinity. This is perverse. This is wrong. This is abomination. This is an affront to the God of heaven. But in realizing these things, that if I manifest the pattern of rebellion and resistance and I use the information that I have learned about God in order to overthrow this authority that has been placed in my life, I will remain stuck in that cycle of rebellion and resistance. What I needed to do was to make sure that I stayed in the channel of blessing and allow God to break every yoke from my back. Come unto me, let my yoke come upon you, and I will break the yokes off. If you try and break those yokes off that are being placed upon you, you will go about it the wrong way. I didn't want to bring upon myself a curse by cursing those who were cursing me. I received a curse in when I st stood up and said, I believe in the one true God and the, and the only begotten Son, 
that those who were appointed to be authorities over me said, we see no light in what you are saying. They pronounced a curse upon what I was doing. They cursed what I was doing. If I reacted to that curse by railing against them, speaking evil of them, challenging them on what they had done to me, I would simply be carrying on the very curse which they had placed upon me. And I would be passing it on to other people and my ministry would be polluted with bitterness and aggression and negativity. And for whatever reason, the Lord in His grace and His mercy said to me, Adrian, we need to make sure that your ministry is not tainted with that spirit. Walk with me. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Let your heart be turned towards your fathers. Even if you must honour them, even if they dishonour you, you must respect them, even if they disrespect you. For this is the way to step back from the curse so that you don't begin to curse that's why I have tried to walk very carefully in this regard. And most of all, my father, my earthly father, my attitude towards him, I've gone to my heavenly father and said, is there anything in my life, is there anything in my soul for which I feel something negative towards my father, for things that he has done to me, anything for which I would feel negative towards him. Because if there's any negativity towards him, it's going to manifest in negativity towards all the other authorities that have been placed in my life. For my father is the cornerstone and my mother is also the support in that relationship. If I have any negativity to either father or mother in my soul, I'm going to have negativity towards all authority in my life. This is what Elijah is saying to us today. He's calling out to us, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. The negativity which you have experienced, my son has endured it all. He has absorbed it all for you. Let me take that negativity upon myself and then you can be released, not to ex simply accept the things that your parents have done to you, but to be at peace about them to be reconciled, to believe that God was still in control, though all these things were wreaked upon you, and that Christ himself has absorbed that curse for you, if you can believe. This is what I believe Elijah is saying to us today. It is not the harshness of, or the clarity of logic on all of the beliefs of Scripture. It is not the hard argumentation alone that will bring about a revival, but it is the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. As it says in Luke 1.17, to prepare a people ready for the Lord requires that the disobedient be turned to the justice, the wisdom of the just. We must have our hearts reconciled. We must have Christ fully formed within. And so I would pray for all of us here, Whatever authority is in your life, search your heart. Go privately. Lord, is there anything in my heart where I feel animosity towards someone that has treated me unfairly, a, a father or a figure? If that father figure is no longer here, you can ask forgiveness. God can give you that forgiveness. If you're no longer able to speak to a father or mother or to a teacher or to a pastor that you have spoken to, inadvertently in a wrong way God is able to release us from all these things and once we become free of that curse in Christ Jesus we will be prepared to meet the Lord this is a message that has challenged me personally I've been confronted by this the Lord has showed me how poor I have been as a father how easily affected I am to begin to try to feel the spirit to try and control my wife and my children and to make them conform to what I desire because of the worthlessness I have experienced and by the grace of God I'm determined not to allow that spirit to rule over me but that my wife and my children would live in an environment of freedom and liberty and that they know that I love them and that I care for them, but that I will speak to them on things from Scripture in a spirit of love and gentleness. This is what I pray for in my life.
I pray that you will take these thoughts and go privately and, and speak to the Lord about them so that Elijah can speak to us and turn our hearts back to our fathers and as parents that our hearts can be turned to our children that we will no longer curse them because Christ has absorbed the curse and that we will be prepared to meet the Lord. I think we had a closing hymn. Oh, you got a, you've got another song? Let's do the song and then we'll have a hymn. I'd like to close with a hymn and then I'll pray.